I want to introduce our moderators tonight. We have three moderators. All three are students. Um, and they will ask questions of the various panelists that we have. And it's going to be a great night. I um, want to start by introducing um, uh, Isabel Stacco. Isabel, you want to wave? There you go. All right. Um, Isabel is a senior at Brockton High School, and her journey with science started her sophomore year when she discovered an after-school biotechnology program happening at her school where she learned how to clone and purify, I can't pronounce this, luciferase. From there, uh, she got a summer internship at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute that summer. And this past summer, she was at the Broad Institute at MIT doing a summer internship as well. Um, Isabel also participated in the Brockton area NAACP Act So competition for high school students and even made it to nationals. Currently, she's working on a machine learning project that she plans to submit to the Regeneron Science Talent Search. And it's uh, often referred to as the Nobel competition for high school seniors, where the top prize is um, superintendent, uh, hold on to your seat when you hear this. The top prize is $250,000. Isabel hopes to continue to pursue, pursue biomedical research in college and plans to major in micro and cellular biology. Um, then we have Stephanie Amanze. Stephanie, you want to wave? There we go. Uh, Stephanie is a sophomore at Brockton High School and takes chemistry as her science course this year. She has a love for all things medicine and sociology related and hopes to be an anesthesiologist one day. Stephanie also participated in the NAACP's AXO competition in the health and medicine category and her project on obesity, uh, which had a lot of support from Superintendent Thomas, um, won her a bronze medal nationally. Stephanie loves topics concerning environmental justice with the imminent threat of climate change hanging all over us. And then our third moderator tonight is Ivanji Jack. You wanna wave, Ivanji, there you go, thank you. Uh, Ivanji is 14 years old and he's a freshman at Avon Middle High School. He's uh, actually the epitome of the definition of the acronym STEM. For the science part of STEM, he participated in the school's seventh grade science fair and tied for first place with his passive infrared robot. In the technology part of STEM, Ivanji is currently learning how to code in Python. For the engineering part of STEM, he loves to build Lego structures and has built the Lego maze, as well as the Lego chess checker set. And in the math part of STEM, well, math is Ivanji's favorite subject, and he's currently in honors geometry. He's also very active in the community, will be participating in ACTSO this year, and Ivanji has received the John F. Kennedy Make a Difference Award. Overall, he really likes STEM and is grateful to be one of the moderators for tonight's event. So I am going to hand things over. I'm going to hand the reins over to Isabel right now, um, who will take us into um, the rest of the evening. Take it away, Isabel. Okay, thank you, Pat, for the introductions. So before we get into the panel discussion tonight, I just want to give a quick shout out to Superintendent Thomas. And for those of you who don't go to Brockton Public Schools, Michael P. Thomas is the superintendent of the Brockton Public Schools, and he was a graduate of Brockton High School. Superintendent Thomas ha have lived on the east side during his life and started off as a physical education teacher at West Middle School. He was also on the original, he was original staff member for the Boys and Girls Club in Brockton when it first opened its doors in 1991. From there, he oversaw the physical education department at Brockton High School. Then from there, he went from the assistant housemaster to housemaster at the school and eventually getting all his way up to the superintendent of Brockton Public Schools after Superintendent Smith's retirement in 2019. So um, welcome, Superintendent Thomas. And do you want to say a couple of words before we get started tonight?
Okay, so in that case, we're just going to get on to our panel discussion tonight. So first up, we have Dallas. And Dallas is a Brockton native who is currently an emergent scientist at the Broad Institute. She graduated in 2019 from Emanuel College in Boston with a degree in biology concentrated in the health sciences. And now she is currently a member in the Dr. Ramnik Xavier Laboratory in the Infectious Disease and Microbiome Program, where they study the human gut microbiome biome in relation to healthy and disease state, which requires both wet lab and computational skills. Hi, everyone. Why don't we have the other uh, moderators um, introduce the other panelists? All right, I will be in, so I will be moderating Larry and Larry, Dr. Larry Allade is a stock assessment scientist, a task leader in the population dynamics branch of the Northeast Fisheries Science Fisheries. He earned his PhD in marine estuary and environmental sciences and a master's in applied computer sciences at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. His expertise and research interest is in the fish population dynamics and fisheries management. He leads a number of ground fish stock assessments in the Northeast region. He was the former U.S. representative and a current member on the advisory committee for the International Council for Exploration of the Seas. Over the course of his career, he has received a number of accolades, including two Department of Commerce Bronze Medal Awards for his contribution in species climate vulnerability study in the Northeast United States, and for his contribution for improving the stock assessment process in the region. Recently, he was awarded the prestigious John Bullard Award for his work to promote diversity and inclusion in fisheries and in the Woods Hole scientific community. In his spare time, he loves to cook, spend time with his wife and three kids, and enjoys leisurely drives along the coast of Cape Cod. Welcome, Larry. Thank you. And Stephanie, did you want to uh, introduce the person you're moderating? Yeah. Hi, I'm Stephanie, and I will be introducing Michael Joseph. Michael Joseph knows that youth and young adults have that have more access to professional and employment with experimental learning opportunities become successful adults. This is his second year at Mass Hire Greater Brockton Workforce Board Youth Works as a recruitment and engagement liaison and his 13th year working with youth and young adults. In addition, his professional working experiences also include business startups, community engagement, and higher education. Michael currently holds a Bachelor of Science in Business with a focus on marketing from the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay, so I don't know if Superintendent um, Thomas is uh, available yet. I know he had something else he was doing this evening too, but he wanted to come on and make sure that he was participating. So maybe we can get into the questions at this point and then uh, maybe bring him back in in a little while. So Isabel. Okay, that sounds like a plan. So my first question is actually to all the panelists and it doesn't matter which one of you guys want to start off, but I want you guys to go back to maybe your first starting days out in STEM. And my question is, what was the moment or the experience that made you realize that you want a career in STEM? I think you're gonna to have to call on them one at a time. I think I can go first on that one. So this is Larry Alade. Uh, I don't think like, you know, when I'm looking back that I really had that moment, but one thing I really knew back in my academic years or during my youth was a really profound interest in quantitative uh, subjects, you know, the physics, uh, your mathematics, uh, you know, chemistry, doing analytical chemistry. And so, 
somewhere I knew that, you know, just really trying to get a sense of how to quantify the world was where my interest, I started off like in medicine, you know, in biomedical sciences uh, in my undergraduate years. And uh, over the years, you know, I started gravitating towards like, you know, more quantitative sciences, trying to go into something that was relatively in that required a level of high level of computation. So I was thinking more of like, you know, in the area of genomics. But, you know, the way I sort of stumbled into my career was more of a discovery phase. It was quite exciting because if you asked me 20 years ago that, would you be a fishery biologist? I had no idea what that field was all about. Grew up in a landlocked area and uh, pretty much everything that, you know, in my environment was more medically related. So that was sort of like, you know, the driver there. So it was nice to kind of get out, you know, from home, explore the world a little bit and had some influences and you know i'll save maybe the stories for you know later on during the panel discussions but i think that you know my love for mathematics was sort of like you know my starting point that i knew that i want to apply it in science somehow but i just didn't know why how but i ended up uh discovering that process along my academic journey in life Thank you so much, Larry. So Dallas and Michael, do you guys want to go next? Sure. Um, so just like you, Larry, it was kind of like a like a gradual journey. It wasn't like a all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I want to go into STEM. It was like, oh, I really like math. Like, I I really enjoy my psychology class. I'm fascinated about the brain and and how it works. And, and I just kept asking questions and those questions led me um, to different areas, um, even including like physics. Like um, I always enjoyed my time in the lab. Um, so in high school, it was not like super long lab periods. It was like, like one and a half hours, but gearing towards college, it kind of got towards like three hours and, and it would just fly by. There'd be other people like looking at the clock, looking at their watch, like, oh, when is it going to be over? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm having the best time. So it was like a gradual thing for me. I've always really enjoyed math, um, psychology, and um, have been very curious. So, yeah. Yeah, um, I agree with uh, Dallas. I think more or less um, just having curiosity and, and, uh... Uh, you know, wondering, you know, how people thought, uh, you know, understanding people's thought process. Um, you know, my journey was a little bit different in the sense that, um, you know, I, I eventually went to school for, for marketing um, and just the kind of understanding the, the thought pr process of understanding analytics, as uh, Larry kind of mentioned, um, having an interest in that. Um, and for, I was fortunate in high school to actually go through an internship process that kind of led me uh, in, in, into the uh, career that I'm, that I'm currently in now. So uh, for me, I would say that, you know, just having the opportunity to have an internship uh, really exposed me to different areas. Okay, guys, thank you so much for answering that question. Um, before we get into Vanji's question, I just want to, I saw that Michael Thomas has came back on, and I just want to say, hi, um, Superintendent, if you want to say a couple of words before we continue. No, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry I had a, I'm a daughter, so I had to run over and do a quick 10-minute conference and come back. So no, I just want to thank, um, thank you for inviting me and having me here. I want to thank every all the students for participating in this. You make the Brockton Public Schools very proud. Um, I'm amazed at your talent um, and just uh, how talented you are and how much you put into this. I want to thank uh, Pat and Phyllis, um, the NAACP and the Brockton Public Library for supporting this program. It's always been great. Um, and, and just all the wonderful different things that you do, Leona from the, um, Education Committee and how much uh, the NAACP supports the Brock Brockton Public Schools and their students. It's much appreciated. And uh, again, I'll, I'll stop talking because you don't want to hear much from me, but I really appreciate and I'm always amazed at the talent uh, of, of the young people of Brockton. It's, it's simply incredible. So I thank you and um, you make us very proud.
Thank you so much, Superintendent Thomas. Um, Yvonne, do you have your next question? All right. So, Larry, I have a question for you. What do you do exactly as a member of the task lead for the Population Dynamics Branch? I'm glad you asked because, you know, when I first started my career and I tell people I'm a fishery stock assessment biologist, I usually get that glaze over their eyes and it took me a long time to really describe what exactly we do. So maybe sort of kind of stepping back, you know, kind of give you a little bit of context of what really means to do stock assessment so that individuals can understand, you know, the science behind that. So, you know, stock assessment is uh, just the science of really getting a sense of uh, the health of the ocean resource. So it's a scientific process that, you know, uses a variety of data sources. And so we serve a variety of clients, you know, so think about fishermen when they're out there, they're catching, uh, they're catching fish or they're harvesting and, you know, bringing, contributing to the region's economy. And also think about the federal government also conducting their independent surveys just to kind of know like how many fish are out there in the ocean. So we usually use this really complex data and it's really more complicated than I'm saying to really feed into really this complex mathematical models to kind of get a sense of what's happening in the ocean. So in other words, what's the state, what's the health of the resource? Or we is the health and is the health of the fisheries that we're uh, that you know that the fishermen are harvesting. Are they in good state, meaning that are they overfished, or is the level of exploitation so high? And so this information, if you really think about it, it's not really done out of this necessity for curiosity, but it actually serves a purpose because it fits into a management process. So me as a scientist will do all the computation and analysis, and I provide scientific advice to managers. Managers can use that information to inform industry and to inform how they're going to manage the resource. So they highly, they highly depend on the work that we do. And it's, you know, codependence between the management and also the scientists that work together hand in hand to make sure that they provide in valuable products that, you know, that allow for the sustainable sustainability of our resource. So that's kind of like stock set assessment in a, in a nutshell. So what did I do in the Northeast Fishery Science Center? I'm a task leader. So a task leader means I'm a supervisory. So I have a number of staff that do work under, me, under, uh, under my task. And my daily operations is really kind of like, you know, developing scientific ideas of how do we improve the underlying science that we use to assess the various resource in the Northeast United States. You know, and so part of that, you know, there's the administrative overhead that comes along with that. But the fun part of it is just really sitting down, coming up with the science and also chairing various like, you know, scientific committees to uh, continue to improve, you know, the science that continues to inform the assessments. If you think about nature, nature is very complex. And so there's very little that we know about the ocean. So there's often like, you know, really new ideas that always come into the table and it's always evolving very quickly. And that's what makes the job very interesting. And so you think about individuals who are going out to sea, who are collecting the information, the individuals who are in the labs, who are actually providing demographic information about what's going on with the fishery. So there's really a variety of partners we work with and collaborate to sort of like really say something about what the health of that ocean, to have a sound scientific process that really informs managers at the end of the day to make sustainable choices in terms of making sure that resource are sustained over the long haul and has economic benefits to the region as, as a whole. All right, thank you. I have the next question for uh, Michael, and it says, spending a lot of time working with youth, do you think that what they learn slash experience in school encourages them to go to STEM careers, especially for minority youth? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the very last part of that. It said, especially for minority youth. I'm sorry, can you repeat the, the question? I, I didn't uh, quite hear you. Yes, yeah, Stephanie, repeat the whole question a little louder, please. Spending a lot of time with youth, do you think that what they learn slash experience in school encourages them to go into STEM careers, especially for minority youth? That's, a, that's an excellent question, Stephanie. Thanks for asking that. Um, 
So, I mean, in my experience, um, I, I do believe that um, what uh, youth are currently learning in school um, it definitely prepares them. Um, however, I think um, as as a uh, you know uh, as a, as a as a community, I think one of the issues that we're finding is that um, there's not necessarily enough resources and although there are absolutely tons of resources out there uh, especially uh you know pat does an excellent job with a lot of the resources that she provides um i think that there's not enough uh maybe not enough communication in allowing uh our students to know you know what those resources are and how they could um lead to uh you know different career paths and that's why you know you know uh, events such as this are key to uh, our community um, because this is you know uh, you know one of the ways that our, our youth actually find out about you know different career paths that are available to them uh, so as far as the, the preparation I think the preparation is there um, the opportunities are there um, there's a slight disconnect in terms of just getting the word out on what those opportunities are. Um, so fortunately, we do have uh, someone like Pat to, uh, to, to, that's, that's able to uh, make that connection um, and partner up with us as well to uh, assist us in, in helping us make that connection as well. Thank you. May I add to that? I think that was a very interesting question. If there's time, I'll ask the moderators if that's okay. So uh, I wholeheartedly uh, agree with Michael on that. And a lot of the things that we're dealing with in a federal agency is how do we sort of like, you know, expand opportunities within the scientific agency or even within STEM to make sure that, you know, when decisions are being made in terms of like, you know, our resources, that there is equal representation at the table. And I truly believe, I definitely believe that there is a communication barrier there too. There's also the access to resource too, because what we often find out is that there's not an equity in terms of distribution of resource. And so one of the ways, you know, such programs like this, where we're communicating where those resources are available and how to make those resources connect to like, you know, underserved communities is very important. And it's also important not only that, you know, we sit within our own agencies and expect that, you know, people will know about what we do, but it's very important that we as representatives of our res respective organizations go out and sort of like, you know, do this type of communications, share the work that we do. People can see people that, you know, look like them within their fields to inspire others to kind of like, you know, sort of expand the level playing field. So it's a very complicated topic. Yes, there's preparation from a theoretical standpoint of view, but there's also beyond the textbook that I always say that that experience, because a lot of us had one experience that really inspired us that continue to like, you know, allow us to do the job that we do that, you know, we're obsessed with or that we really love, you know, that we do every day. So this type of communication is important. I'm happy to be a part of this panel because this is a, a platform to be able to share, you know, the type of work that we do. So thank you. Okay, so my next question is for Dallas. And an easy assumption that I'm guilty of about working in a lab is that everyone keeps to themselves or everyone's for themselves in a lab. So my question to you is, did you have any similar assumptions about working in a lab? And if so, how were they proven wrong? Um, good question. I, I think that I would maybe came from the other, um, the other side of, of that perspective in that um, going into undergrad, um, I was really interested in potentially joining one of the research teams on campus. Um, so that is one of the professors at Emanuel College. Um, there's actually a handful of them um, that do research um, and um, there's this one lab and it's called the MERGE lab. Um, I think it stands for 
microbial research groups um, at a manual or, or something um, of that sort. And so I got to see by just studying on the same floor as the lab, you can like see through into the lab. So they, everyone just works very um, collaboratively. There's lots of communication. Um, there's often scientists like doing an experiment together um, and pushing through projects that way. And when I transitioned into um, the role that I'm currently in, um, the Xavier Lab, there's there's about like 80 of us. <laughs> half of us are at the Broad Institute and the other half of us are at um, Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and it is really astounding how collaborative we are. Um, for instance, I work very, very closely with three gastroenterologists. Um, and then I also work very closely with, um, with a platform called MOC, which is the Microbial Omics Core, where we prepare um, DNA for sequencing. And there's lots of like robotics there. So it, it really is a collaborative effort. And, and I hope that maybe this past summer you were able to um, kind of see the more collaborative side of, of the science. Do you think that is true? Yeah, definitely like when I did my internship, even online, definitely my lab wasn't 80 people, which I thought is kind of insane. I've only worked in labs that have like about like 10 to 12 people. But even with those 10 to 12 people online, I have I have seen like they all um, laugh at their mistakes together and they're very collaborative. Yeah. yeah, that's important is to kind of like move through your failures and your mistakes because being a scientist, things oftentimes don't work as you want them to the first time and the second time and the third time and the fourth time and the fifth time maybe the sixth time it will be great <laughs> but yeah yeah so that that's really nice that you were able to kind of take that away with you all right my next question is for all of the panelists and my question is if you did choose this career, what career would you have chosen? You can go first, Larry. Good question. If I haven't chosen this career, I think that, you know, it would be somewhat still related. I think it would be somewhere analytical. I can see being a statistician, perhaps being an engineer. I know, I mean, I really gravitated to those, those type of quantitative type of, uh, you know, work. So anything that has to do with numerical analysis is a passion of mine. I love playing with numbers. I love coding. So those are possible options. And one of the things that I love about my field, that's like quite broad, you know, we talk about STEM, you know, those who are in the trenches who are doing the science, but you got really think about the collaborative nature of it. You know, you have people who are engineers who are building the tools that we're using for stock assessment or collecting information out at sea. You have the, the lab technicians, you have um, the IT or the, the, the engineers who are coding the different programs that we're using for like doing analysis. So there is a breadth of opportunities that can come in there. So somewhere along the line, I know that I may have landed here some way, even if I didn't hear about, but it's probably going to be somewhere quantitative. Very interesting. Thank you. How about you, Michael? That's a very good question. Um, I think for me, uh, similar to Larry, uh, I think I, I probably would have been pulled into doing something similar to what I'm doing now. Um, but I, I, I also have an interest in, um, uh, in engineering as well. Um, but from the computer stamp, standpoint uh, and coding, um, but I love working with, with uh, you know, teens and young adults. So I think regardless, somehow, some way, I probably would have been pulled back in to doing something similar, you know, to what I'm doing now. Um, so if I had a choice, it'd probably be, you know, something related to uh, coding and engineering. Very interesting. It seems that you all enjoy your jobs very much. And even if you didn't choose this exact one, you would have chose something similar. So how about you, Dallas? 
Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I think that um, if anything, like the the role that I could also see myself in like interchangeably to the one that I am in now is like project management. So managing the different um, science projects that we have and how we coordinate with um, different collaborators to um, bring projects forward to completion. All right, thank you for all your answers. I will now turn it over to Stephanie. Uh, okay, so my next question is for Michael again, and it's how do you think students should go about progressing from being a high school student to a college freshman? Um, so that's, that's a great question. So I think uh, one of the key things that, you know, any student should begin doing uh, the minute, you know, they're, they're uh, transitioning, if you will, is to begin to do, you know, as much research as possible. Um, and, you know, that could be, you know, to the, to the type of school you're going to be going to, to the uh, teachers you'll be dealing with, to the types of classes uh, you'll be taking. Um, and then you want to see if that fits, you know, your short and long-term goals. Um, if you're thinking about college in the end, um, you know, what are some of the uh, classes that can prepare you for the next step after that? Um, so you always want to try and think, you know, three to four years ahead of what's happening before you just for planning purposes, um, just so that, um, you know, as you transition uh, from one grade to the next, you can kind of foresee, you know, what your future is, is going to look like. Um, it's because what, what, what's not really being said in school is that, you know, you're, ultimately you are in control of your future. Uh, so you are the CEO of your destiny, <laughs> if you will. So I would say that, you know, uh, research is key. Um, and then also, you know, trying to create some sort of support group. Um, that could be, you know, uh, yeah, your parents, your siblings, um, you know, people at school, um, you know, people like Pat, for example, um, you know, those that could give you the type of advice that you'll need as you're uh, going through your transition. Thank you. And I'm going to hand it over to Isabel. Thank you, Stephanie. So my next question is for Dallas. And this is something we touched on briefly in our last interaction, but something that I had to overcome as a student scientist, I'm just gonna call myself, is when, experience, when experiments don't go as planned or they just don't go well at all. So I was wondering if you can speak on any times where a certain experience or experiment of yours or a colleague didn't go well. And if you have any advice for a student scientist about being okay when an experiment doesn't go well. Sure, um, when I was in undergrad, um, I think this is a really good example. Um, if anyone has heard of like a PCR reaction, a polymerase chain reaction, um, essentially, it is putting in a piece of, of DNA um, into, into a tube, and then you also put um, forward and reverse primers, which allow um, like binding to two different parts of, of the DNA piece that you have. And then you add in a, a polymerase. Um, and also DNTPS, which is um, kind of like the building blocks of the DNA and water. Um, and I hope that I'm not forgetting anything because I'm on a panel. <laughs> but there, there's different components of the PCR reaction. And if you forget one of those components, or even if um, like a, a primer isn't diluted to the correct um, proportion that it, that it is, um, that it is supposed to be, uh, the reaction might not amplify your DNA. Um, and also another component of, of PCR reactions is after you do the PCR, sometimes you wanna purify the DNA too. And if you purify the DNA, if there's like a step that goes wrong there, uh, you can also lose the DNA. So by the time you go to check, oh, is it still there? 
is it what we think that it is? Uh, sometimes it's not. Sometimes there's nothing there. And you're like, oh, where did it go wrong? There's so many steps. Where do I start? Um, you have to start somewhere, you know, just um, you have to start somewhere. And I think there is, there's something really special about like failing and um, when things go wrong, because it can be very frustrating, but can you have grace in that moment? Can you give yourself the space to think, to walk away and then come back, to have a fresh mind, um, a good night's sleep and, and, and be patient with the process because not everything is, is going to go the way that you want it to in life. Even if we like say that one path that we, that we want to go down in life is we want to do that straightforward. It's not going to go that way. It's going to be like zigzags there, there and back. So just being prepared that things are not always going to go the way that uh, we might think they're going to go and, and be okay and accept um, that things don't always go that way. And, and just be kind to yourself, be kind to the people around you um, and get through it together. Thank you, Dallas. That was such a great answer. So I'll pass it on to Yvonne All right, Larry, since you are, since you work with fish as a fisheries biologist, what is your favorite fish to study and why? I don't think I have any particular fish, favorite fish that I really study because I look at them in terms of uh, numbers. I do say that I do like a certain taxa of uh, fish that I work with, which are the flounders. They're very interesting in terms of their life history. Uh, they have, uh, they've got quite a bit of a history here in New England, you know, when you actually understand the historical context and its contribution to the economy and studying after the Second World War when, uh, you know, there was really heavy exploitation of them. So I think that the history that goes be uh, behind that is quite interesting because when I'm building these models, you're often thinking about not only the biological aspects of it, but I'm actually thinking about what has happened over the years. How have the regulations changed? How has the environment really changed that I can sort of like, you know, really model all this sort of processes through time. And so that's what's kind of, you know, really keeps me fascinated about like, you know, building models because you can make this model as complicated as you want. You know, so part of that is that I find really fascinating about like, you know, studying fish is really understanding their history, understanding the biological processes, understanding the ecology. We're talking about like, you know, interactions between various species. How do you bring those complexity into place? And not only that, we talk about climate. We know that there's impact of climate when it comes to like, you know, the resilience of the resource that we're studying. So there's a lot of really complex factors coming into. And so I enjoy flounders because of just their complex life history and how well that, you know, a lot of work has been done when it comes to like looking at all the external factors that, you know, that impact them. And I'm often challenged all the time and overwhelmed by just like, you know, where do you start? Because, you know, this process is, can be quite complicated and there's all from consequences to kind of like really think that all of these are acting at the same at the same time, but how do you sort of like, you know, really think through each of these processes and create like a realistic picture? Because at the end of the day, you want to get as much accuracy in terms of like the scientific advice you're giving forward. So I'm often like, you know, driven by like, you know, just really taking the biology and translating that to like, you know, what it looks like in a model framework. Ah. Uh -huh. So basically, it's kind of not as in favorite, but as in what kind of gives the best information for your job. Well, what gives the best information, but also what's interesting, what I really love is just the processes that are really influencing what we understand and why the, you know, the current state of a resource. You know, as there have been changes in the ocean that's been occurring, how do you sort of like think about algorithms of how you put that and how do you code that? 
you know, are there interactions where you have introduction of species in certain areas because there's been a temperature change and then there's competition in terms of, you know, the, the food and the resource that you're eating. So the processes I think behind it is what really fascinate me, but not necessarily the species itself. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, all right. I will now turn it to Stephanie. Hello again, and the last question is for all the panelists, and it says, do you feel like your career has the potential to impact major issues and injustices in the world today? And if so, how? Michael, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I, I would say um, absolutely. Um, I mean, working in this uh in this local economy um you know we we uh we actually um you know impact this economy you know annually um and what i mean by that is just a small example um we have uh summer jobs that that we are that we offer where we hire um uh, pretty much a little bit over 200 youths every summer um and we place them in, in different companies uh throughout uh, the region. Um, and I'll give a quick example. Um, last summer, not this previous summer, but, the, uh, but the last year, um, I had uh, some youths that had an interest in the tech field. Um, and it's, I mean, Brockton's not really necessarily known as a tech uh, space, um, but there are some, some IT and tech related companies. And they're, you know, they're, little by little, they're starting to move into the area. Um, so I was kind of tasked with trying to identify some opportunities for these young youths uh, for the summer. And we came across a uh, startup uh, company uh, right off of uh, Main Street. Um, it's called uh, 33 Dover Street, I want to call it. And it's a professional's workspace. Um, but they also have a uh, company within that workspace um, where it's, it's, it's somewhat of an online company and they were, they're in startup phase at that point um, and they were looking for some extra help. And I actually, part of my job is actually to, to go out and, and uh, find potential employers uh, for our organization. So I was able to identify uh, this company where they had a need and I had these, these youths. We had uh, two that were, one was a senior, one was a, a senior in high school, a junior in high school, and a sophomore going into his junior year in college. Um, and they all had an interest in, in something tech related, but they wasn't sure where. And they all had some skills in the area as well. And we were able to place them there. Um, and from that experience, they were able to, to actually help uh, this startup company um, kind of go on and, and, and do not only just develop their product, but actually launch a campaign um, you know, that by the end of that summer, um, and you know what that did, does did for those uh, three youths is that it gave them the opportunity to now say on a resume that they they have um, tech experience, um, and you know uh, for, for you know for that to happen in, in an area um, such as Brockton, I think is a is a you know huge success, um, and that's just you know a, a small example of you know some of the things that that we're trying to do. That's that's um, you know innovating the area and, and, and creating you know more progressive opportunities uh, for our youths and young adults. So so I, I I do believe that we you know at, at this point we are uh, moving forward and are creating uh, you know a lot of opportunities for our, our youth and young adults. Thank you, and for the rest we are a little bit um, short on time, so um, Larry, would you like to go next? Yeah, uh, I'll quickly uh, just maybe uh, go over answer here. So if you really think about it, I think that there's a, a huge impact. I mean, think about fisheries. It contributes $14 billion annually to the GDP. And so where I look about fisheries, fisheries are an important sustainable food resource. So we're talking about our food security domestically. And I think it also supports an economic sector for our coastal communities and people's livelihoods. So if you really unpackage that, you know, the process of the science that really informs the management process, it's a very important piece. We have to make sure that we get that right and that, you know, people's lives are directly impacted. As I said, it's not done at uh, our our 
I guess our, our, our desire to do the science or the necessity to do the science under the law, it's not driven by just the fact that, you know, we are curious, there is a direct impact here. Another part of that equation too is like one of the things I do as a scientist is mentor a lot of young youths as well. And so it's a very important that, you know, we continue to mentor the next generation of scientists that will be coming down the pipeline that we're going to be supervising who are going to change the world. We also know in our backyard here in the Gulf of Maine that the waters are heating up, you know, the global, uh, you know, there's a there's climate change. So we certainly know that that has impact on the resources as well, too. And so there's a lot of challenges with the sciences. And I think that collectively, when I'm thinking about, you know, the the individuals or the demographics that are involved in terms of making decisions we have to make sure that we are very inclusive we are open opportunities people are thinking about problems from different perspective bringing their cultural background how they form hypotheses how they think about the world because i think that's the only way when we have everyone involved that we can continue to come back you know some of these challenging issues and to be able to ensure that we have a long-term sustainability of the resource that really impacted people in our region and across the nation Thank you. And um, Dallas? That was wonderfully said, Larry. That was nail on the head. So great. You spoke for both of us there. It was, yeah, it, it, it's important to have different perspectives. And the reason why I chose the Broad Institute is because I wanted to be in a, a diverse place um, where there was different perspectives um, that are, that were different than my own. We could debate things and have uh, conversation and, and tackle challenges from different viewpoints and bring our strengths together so that we could accomplish whatever we needed to accomplish by collaborating. It, 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 yeah, it's very, very important to um, continue to mentor. Um, I also really, um, enjoy and um, really love to mentor students as well. Um, so yeah, just continuing the chain effect of being inclusive of the next generation, bringing them into it and saying, you have a voice, use that voice. Um, your voice deserves to be heard. So speak. Thank you. And I'm going to hand it off to Isabel. Okay, thank you. So that's going well before I conclude the first part of the panel, I would like to open it up to the attendees to say to ask any questions they might have to any of the three panelists, either they can unmute themselves or they can write it in the chat box. So I'll give a couple of seconds for that. Um, I have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, what would the participants on the panel say to like kids who are, they want to go into STEM field, but they're having a Taught, like struggling through STEM classes and they worry that they might not be able to be in a STEM field because they're having some difficulties. I think I'll go first on that because that reminds me of my past as well too. I struggled and here I am today and one of the things I knew is like I had passion for STEM and uh and the sciences you know but i kept on working at it i kept on finding resources to make sure that i continue to improve you know my baseline of knowledge you know i just knew that you know one of the things i know is that there's no hope for a satisfied scientist and i often carry that through so whatever i know today there's always going to be something tomorrow to learn so it's a lifelong journey and even after i've reached where i am in my career i feel like you know for the rest of my life if i continue along this path that i'll continue to learn so stay at it you know, continue to find resources, look for different ways to continue to strengthen the knowledge. And I think the passion that you have for it is just the starting point, you know, and it just comes a point that I felt that the light bulb sort of switched that it all connected together for me. And, you know, I just didn't let go and get discouraged easily because maybe I took that, you know, differential equation course and I got the C. So maybe I earned that C in that course, but the knowledge that I gained in that class really propelled me a lot in that knowledge rather than taking the really simple course and feeling that, you know, I'm excelling very well. So I had my struggles, you know, I had challenges along the way academically, but I certainly knew that this was the path that I wanted to stay on and I find ways to get through it.
And I'll just say I, I, I agree with Larry. Um, you know, the, the passion is a starting point. Uh, let, let the passion uh, carry you forward. Um, I mean, in life, you're always going to have struggles. Uh, but if, if, you're, if, you're, if it's something that you're, you know, passionate about, um, you know, just continue on. Just continue on with the fight. Um, you know, uh, and, and try your best to be in the moment. Um, a lot of times where we do think ahead and, we, and we're thinking, oh, if I don't do well on this one test, then my whole life is, is, through, is through. But the truth is, that's not the truth at all. Um, so just try and be in the moment and focus on what's in front of you um, and, and just move forward. One thing that was also helpful for, for me, and I, I agree with um, both Larry and, and Michael, was asking for help, um, creating like weekly appointments with my professors and my, my teachers um, to make sure that I was able to fully grasp and understand what was um, being taught in lecture. Um, so if you don't ask for help, the answer is always going to be no. So ask. And I, actually, I just want to add to that and just um, re uh, try to identify a mentor as well. Um, again, it could be an instructor, it could be a professional person, um, just somebody that understands, uh, you know, what you're looking to do um, that could give you that extra support and direction. I want to say that I concur with the notion of having a mentor. I think that it's a huge part of like, you know, our success, you know, even coming to the Northeast Fisheries Science Center as uh, coming in after my postgraduate work, I still had mentors who I work with. Even in my position right now as a leader, I have mentors that I'm working with because I do have like places, you know, a target of where I see my career. So I think it's a very, very valuable resource having that mentor that will sort of help you navigate, not only in the academic, but also in the, you know, when you're thinking about your career in the future as well, it, it comes in handy. Okay, thank you, panel. Does anyone have any final questions? Uh, I have three questions. So the first one is, what do you find most interesting and exciting about your jobs? Larry, you can go first. I think what I really, really enjoy is the idea of like, and it sounds very cut and dry, coding is a lot of fun, being in the trenches and trying to figure, because for me, it's like, you know, trying to put a puzzle together. And so you have this idea of what you're trying to achieve and you sort of going through this module and you're going through this painstaking approach and it sounds very gruesome and it is often sometimes, but uh, I think the idea of being able to solve a problem through like, you know, coding, it's a really exciting part of my job. And so when it comes to data manipulations and it comes to like, you know, assembling data sets and kind of understanding it and using various sophisticated techniques to kind of like, you know, bring um, knowledge or some sort of inference about the data collection process that, you know, we're trying to feed into models. I really, really enjoy that process in my job. And also, not only that, I also enjoy the people I work with, you know. Um, I work in a very fun place. People share knowledge and, you know, there's quite a broad um, diversity of individuals with various types of backgrounds. And, you know, people share, they're very helpful, they're very personable, they want to see you succeed. So, you know, the people really make a difference too in terms of like, you know, making it easy for you to succeed in your job. The second question is, what do I need as a student to have a career in STEM? Michael, would you like to answer this one? Sure, I think it, um, it actually uh, goes to, you know, what we uh, previously, previously discussed, which is uh, one is identifying, you know, your interest level. And um, if you have an interest level, is it, are you passionate about that interest level? So just identifying, you know, what that is, 
um, and then sticking to it um, and then finding, you know, resources that could help you actually get there. Um, and, and again, creating that support uh, team, if you will, around uh, your idea um, and moving forward uh, with it. Uh, the third and final question is, do you have any suggestion for a science fair project? You can answer this one, Dallas. I thought about this earlier, <laughs> um, but I'm not sure what the access is like to like um, media plates, but one idea is to uh, study the oral microbiome of like your family members or just like random sample of your friends where you just take a, a cheek swab and then you streak it out onto a media plate and you see what bacteria are growing. What do they look like? Um, how many of them are there? Are there a lot? Are there a little? Um, what, what happens if you, if you put um, half of the plates in the fridge and half of the plates um, in like a, a warm, it's say if it's warm outside, you put them in, in outside where it's warm and then some at room temperature. Do the, are there differences in the amount of like bacteria that grow on there? Um, do they look different based on the different temperatures that you put them at? Um, I think that would be really fascinating for like high school students to see, so. And I think you can yeah. take that further by like saying you want to count them, kind of understand the kind of lifestyle you live and maybe use that to forecast, you know, the diversity of bacteria that do exist within your own environment. So those are kind of very interesting things that you can do. And use technology too. you know, you can take photographs and kind of like, you know, watch the, you know, the media kind of grow through time. So I know you guys are all native to like technology. So, you know, including a little bit of technological innovation in your you know, research as well. So that's pretty cool. Thank you for answering my questions. All right, do we have any last questions? It'd have to be kind of quick because we do need to move on to the second panel in the next minute or two. Yes. You can, you know, you're welcome to put the questions in the chat and I'm sure the, um, you know, uh, Michael and Dallas and Larry would be happy to answer them to the extent that they can or I'll be happy to pass the questions on to them and uh, see if you, we can get you those answers that way. Awesome, I also just wanted to mention really quickly before we move on that if there are any students curious about internship opportunities, um, the Broad has a uh, summer research program um, called the Broad Summer Scholars Program. And if you'd like to learn more about this um, internship experience, then you can visit uh, B R O A D dot I O slash B S S P. Any final one minute words from the three panelists? Could you repeat that um, link again? Well, why don't you put it into the chat? Perfect. I'll do that. Yeah. So, any, you know, wrap up one minute message that you want to leave the students with, Dallas, Michael, or Larry? Yeah, I just want to say if uh, anybody has any, uh, you know, career interests or resources that they need, they could also uh, find us at masshiregbwb.org. Um, and I'd like to say uh, thank you, Pat, for uh, inviting us, and to everyone on the pan on, on the uh, on the panel. Um, thank you, uh, and all of the uh, yous. I think you did an excellent job. Um, and I just want to say, um, again, you are the, the, the president and CEO of your destiny. Uh, the resources are out there. Um, so whatever you want to do, you could absolutely do it. And, um, and uh, you know, being a part of uh, events such as this is, is, is the, the best thing you can do at this time. I'd like to also echo uh, what Mike said and uh, just want to thank everyone on the panel, uh, Pat, you know, the moderators. I think you guys did a fantastic job. Uh, there were a lot of really great questions. I think that, you know, 
the fact that you are here tonight is just a testament to the start of your journey or even you started earlier. So starting early, I think that's uh, key right there. I think the question suggests that, you know, there's a lot of curiosity. So you already have the baseline there. There's going to be this passion. There's going to be some challenges along the way. But don't let, let that deter you. But that's okay. That's part of the scientific process. Because for every success, there's going to be a number of failures, as it was suggested earlier as well. Uh, I just want to also mention that, you know, as you're thinking along the lines of like, you know, looking for experiences outside of the classroom, uh, NOAA Office of Education, if you Google that, NOAA Office of Education, does offer a variety of programs. And so ranging from high school to like, you know, college. There's also volunteer opportunities where to go out to see. So we hope that, you know, <clears throat> we're looking for the time when COVID will be over. We don't have an end date yet, but, you know, to be able to go out to see and be able to like, you know, do all the fun work that we do out there and get that experience. So I'll be happy, uh, Pat, if you want to share my information with the students, I'll certainly send my information to you. Feel free to contact me anytime and I'll be happy to uh, link you to resources within our agency. So thank you very much for tonight. That's great. Thank you so much, Michael and Dallas and Larry. Um, your input and your responses are just absolutely incredible.